In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus eats with all kinds of people. Lawyers and tax collectors, sinners, disciples, Pharisees, women, the poor, crowds, and what we see today, he even eats with harlots. It really is amazing when you hold all of these meal scenes together to see how Jesus disrupts, intentionally so, the status quo. On top of the scenes themselves, Jesus says quite a bit while sitting at all of these tables. And that's what we've tried to zoom in on in this sermon series. So today is no different. We close out this series with a riddle from verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her sins which were many have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one whom little is forgiven loves little. To fully appreciate this riddle, we have to see it within the whole story. It's about Jesus eating at a Pharisee's house. But it's also about an uninvited woman who shows up and anoints Jesus' feet. Yet it's also about the reaction the crowd has and how Jesus speaks to this woman. All of these are important. So we're going to jump into this story together. We'll start at the beginning in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he took his seat at the table. So this is the context. We're at a Pharisee's house again, just like we were in Luke chapter 5. Up to this point in the Gospel of Luke, the Pharisees, they know that Jesus is something of a prophet, if not a little bit more. He tells parables. But he also loosely plays the role of the Pharisee, yet he does it differently. Intentionally so, he does it and he's starting to get noticed. So out of both intrigue and concern, the Pharisees invite him to dinner. At the heart of the invite, they're searching to know who is this man named Jesus? Is he more than a prophet? Our story today answers those questions, but it requires the help of an uninvited guest. Verse 37. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry his feet with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now remember, first century meal scenes are a public affair. You have the invited, but you also have the uninvited. The uninvited, they show up because they want to see who made the invite list. They stand on the outside of the courtyard and they notice that Jesus, this new prophet, gets the invite. But this woman, the harlot, she does not. Yet hearing that Jesus is present, she shows up. She brings an alabaster jar of oil, fights through the crowd, and anoints Jesus' feet. Now, unlike the other Gospels, this one is not a burial scene. Every Gospel has a, wo- has a woman anointing Jesus' feet. They all point to Jesus moving towards death, but not in the Gospel of Luke. This is something else. Up until this point in the story, there's been an underlying question in Luke for seven chapters. Who is this man named Jesus? Is he more than a prophet? He does go around prophesying quite a bit. He still goes around holding swaths of master class teaching moments. All of these prophecies, all of these teachings, they seem to point to the fact that he's something a little bit more. But can that be? He can't really be the Messiah, right? I mean, that's the question the crowds and the disciples and even the Pharisees are all asking and they're all thinking. And they're not really ready to say yes or no to those questions. Now, we know the answer. Us, the reader, 2,000 years later, we have the backstory. We know about Elizabeth and Zechariah. We know about John the Baptist and Mary and the Magnificat. 
We know about the shepherds and the angels and the star and Bethlehem and the Magi and Simeon and Anna and the temple. We know the story of Jesus' birth. We know Jesus is God incarnate. But nobody else does. The characters in Luke 7 haven't figured it out yet. They're still piecing all of this together. So they invite him to dinner. They want to know what this man is about. And then an uninvited woman shows up and ruins the whole evening. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were really a prophet, he would have known what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She is a sinner. Now, if the jury is still out on whether Jesus is more than a prophet or not, the case is finally closed for the Pharisees here. If he would have really been a somebody, he would have known not to have gotten entangled with this woman. She is beneath the role of the Messiah. She is a sinner. No living prophet would associate with someone who is so unclean. Verse 40, Jesus spoke up and he said, Simon, I have something to say. Well, teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed five denarii, or 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled both of their debts. Now, which one of them loved him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the greater debt canceled. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. In a sweeping parable, Jesus goes right for the ignorant train of thought of the Pharisees and calls them out for their premeditated judgment by showing that this woman has great reason to feel set free. And Jesus isn't done. Verse 44. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has bathed my feet in her tears, dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. She has not stopped kissing my feet since I entered this room. You didn't anoint my head with oil, and she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one whom little is forgiven loves little. And that's the explosive moment that we need to sit with today. Now, I hear Jesus saying, Simon, you have shown me no hospitality. Then you hate on this woman who has had a terribly hard life. Then you ridicule me for noticing her, and then me showing her kindness. Shame on you for springing a trap in which we'd all fail to meet your expectations. It's even more of a shame that you can't even see what it is that you're doing. This woman has sins, but so do you. Verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, they have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. That's the riddle that we have to wrestle with. It is intense. It, this riddle, the more you think about it, the more confusing it gets. Is Jesus saying that she was able to love because she's been forgiven? Or that she's been forgiven because she showed Jesus love. Now, which comes first? Now, verse 47 says it. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one whom little is forgiven loves little. It is confusing. When we break the riddle down into its context, especially when you see it in the Greek, and you compare it to the parallel verses of the woman's actions, I think what the riddle is saying, that the reason she is able to come to the party uninvited, 
The reason she is able to anoint Jesus' feet with oil, the reason she is able to show so much majesty to Jesus is because she has already experienced the grace of forgiveness. It is out of an overflow that she already has received prior to this day that leads her to such an exemplary act. It's not that she earns Jesus' love because she anointed his feet. It's deeper than that. She anoints because she already knows that she's accepted. She already knows that she's loved by Jesus. And she knows that she has been loved much and can in turn love much. Out of that love, she knows she's forgiven. Now the Pharisee, he doesn't live out of love. And that's why he forgives little. Because what you can't see in yourself, you'll never be able to see in others. It's not like the Pharisee has less to be forgiven for. Sin doesn't work that way. Don't think just because this woman is supposedly a harlot that she has more to be forgiven for. Because the Pharisee doesn't recognize his need for forgiveness, he receives less love. The same is true today. When we see our need for forgiveness then love flows. And then watch what happens in verse 48. Then he said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? This is the first time Jesus actually turns his remarks to the woman. And his statement is simple. Your sins are forgiven. He's saying the same thing to us when we are open to seeing ourselves as those who need forgiving. And guess what? The Pharisees finally get their answer to this underlying hunch that Jesus might be more than a prophet. Jesus is the one who even possesses the ability to forgive sins. And it's at this moment we see the Pharisees rise up and notice Jesus is a threat. Sins are only forgiven by the high priest in the temple after proper sacrifice. It is not offered in the shadows of a private dinner to a harlot who shows up uninvited by an uneducated rebel rouser who thinks he's a prophet. From this moment on for the Pharisees, Jesus is the enemy. And he's going to have to be dealt with. But Jesus doesn't care. He keeps on leading with forgiveness and with love. Look what he says next in verse 50. And then he says to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I mean, this is something the Pharisees will never be able to do. To go in peace because they won't ever let this moment go for the rest of the gospel. There will be no peace for them. And it's here we see a real divide. Faith brings salvation. Piety does not. Love emerges from seeking forgiveness, not avoiding the sinful. Forgiveness and love are available to all who seek it, not given to those who just master the status quo. But what you can't see in yourself, you'll never be able to see in others. The Pharisees can't see their need for forgiveness. They are trying to live too purely. They need no forgiveness according to them. And for that, they love little. They see no need in offering forgiveness. And for that, they have no peace. The same could be true for us. One of my old seminary professors is now a pastor in New York. 
He writes a lot for Baptist News Global. He's even preached here. And back in 2015, he preached at my installation service, Dr. Brett Younger. In his September column for the Baptist News Global, he broke down his experience of serving as a foreperson for a grand jury, which he had to serve for two weeks. I want to read an excerpt of what he wrote about. It has everything to do with Luke 5. We spent two weeks listening to stories that make it clear the world needs good churches. There are too many battered, too many hopeless, too many frightened people, and too many angry, unloved, and mean people in the world. We need churches that ask hard questions. What can the church do for a woman that has been beaten by her boyfriend? How should the church care for the cashier who's stealing money to pay for the electric bill? How should the church respond to those who get caught driving drunk? How can the church be honest about the racism that has infiltrated our communities of faith? Does the church worry about what God worries about? Does the church weep over what God weeps over? Does the church love what God loves? What would happen if the church asked broken people, what kind of church do you need? We have enough churches that keep their distance from the shattered lives and who do only what is expected and exist only to maintain the church for a few more years. We need churches that proclaim release to the captives, care to the victims, and to become a family to those who have no family. I do not get to serve on another jury for eight years, but I have been given sufficient evidence that churches need to figure out how to become friends with victims, to change the lives of offenders, and to listen to the brokenhearted. I couldn't agree more with my old professor. What I hear Dr. Younger saying to the church is exactly what Jesus is challenging the Pharisees in Luke chapter 7. The one whom little is forgiven loves little we have to be people who forgive and to seek forgiveness within the spectrum of forgiveness we find love when we find love that leads us into a life of faith which leads us into salvation which leads us into peace your faith has saved you Go in peace.